Hi, I'm Mark Hebner, founder and CEO of IFA, Index Fund Advisors. And I'm excited to, today to have with me David Booth, the founder and chairman at Dimensional Fund Advisors, a friend of mine and somebody that uh, I have been working with for 25 years now. That was the day we started uh, Index Fund Advisors. <laughs> It was March 5th of 1999, and David has graciously agreed to hop on a Zoom call so we can reminisce about the past and the fact that we both have gray hair now. <laughs> yeah. I still have more than you. Yes. And I noticed that you're like 50 years now in the investment business, and I had another business before I did this, but uh, so I'm coming up on my 25th year. And I thought it would be a good time for us to uh, discuss a few topics. We interviewed uh, together in my office probably probably five, six years ago now, maybe more. Maybe more, and yeah. We spent, I think, an hour and 40 minutes going through the whole history of dimensional and of passive investing, it kind of reminded me of that book, Trillions. We went through a lot of the characters involved right. uh, over that whole period. But today I want to cover uh, a num number of topics with David. And so welcome to uh, IFA uh, videos, David. We appreciate you being here. Well, it's a pleasure being here. It's, it's a pleasure working with you for 25 years. <laughs> yeah. It's, it goes yeah. by quickly. Doesn't it go by so quick? It's crazy. You've been amazing in the business you've built. Thank you so much, David. I appreciate that. Couldn't have done it without you. Uh, as I wrote in your book, uh, your vision became an opportunity for me to sort of latch on and, and run with. I remember first reading about what you guys were doing, and I actually had all my money over at Vanguard at the time. And uh, then I was reading about this firm that had these kind of different uh, factors and different uh, research indexes that they were looking at. And I thought, wow, that sounds interesting. So uh, I remember I stopped by your Santa Monica office, and I'm sure you re recall it's famous for the fact that the doors were locked. <laughs> and I'd read about that. And I thought, I'm going, to go, I'm going to go stop in and see him. And I, I got there and I went to open the door and it was locked. And I go, oh, man, it's true. And I kind of pounded on the door and I see a receptionist and she comes over and lets me in. And I went back and Sam Adams came out and started talking to me. And he said, why don't you come back to my office? And I remember he pulled some paper out of his copy machine because he didn't have a yellow pad. And started drawing bell curves and, you know, basically introducing me to the science of investing, which was very refreshing for me. I'm a nuclear pharmacist by education, and that sort of started my whole journey. Anyway, so David, lately I've seen that you've come up with this new acronym, LIFE which stands for Lifetime Integrated Financial Experience. And I thought since this is an area of interest of yours and where you're kind of headed now, we could maybe talk about that acronym and what that means to you and, and why you've latched onto it. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we've built a business uh, around the, the, the F part, the financial part. Yeah. Um, but that's only uh, part of the problem. I mean, you want to... Uh, worry about the financial part over your lifetime. That's the L. And you want to integrate uh, everything you're doing with your investments. It's not, you don't want to look at uh, investing by itself. You want to look at it in context of everything else you're doing. That's the integrated part. Right. And then the E is the experience. Um, and I think that's summed up uh, in some ways best by one of your clients uh, after watching the movie turn out the noise tune out the noise said you know uh, what the, you know uh, what all this does is just makes me feel safe you know uh, and that's right. the experience part yeah you want good returns <clears throat> and you want to you want to feel like you're 
as much in control as you can be. And so you have sensible solutions um, that uh, that you can live with. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. And you've really shown uh, a lot of people how to do that. And I think that's, <clears throat> that's the major reward you and I both feel is seeing them when, when done properly, seeing the impact you have on people's lives. At the end of the day, that's really what it's all about. And I think you're in a particularly good spot because of this mm, pharmaceutical background. We're based on science, you know, you take medicines, uh, you know, all, all of the pharmaceutical science, they, they, they have models of, you know, things that might work, might help, you know, those are rarely proofs, the medicines they come up with. So right. uh, they, but you get insights from doing all that medical research that help you develop uh, a more sensible way to approach things. Then you observe the results and maybe you have to modify your things a bit. You have to be a little flexible and so forth. So that's the pharmaceutical industry. Well, that's the investment industry. You know, you you based on the science, you come up with sensible solutions for people. Then you look at their life experiences and integrate that with what's going on, their investment experience, and be flexible as, as their life changes. Maybe you have to change things around a bit. Uh, you don't have to change things because of market forecast. That's the main thing we all agree upon. Uh, right. <laughs> but uh, on substantive things, uh, you know, um, um, and that really, that's really what life is about too, really, is you dealing with, all of this boils down to dealing with uncertainty. Uh, I know it's a, a risk that people like to shrink away from the topic, uh, but um, by the time people approach you to um, to help them out, they've already dealt with a lot of uncertainty in their lives. You know, people who could have forecast 25 years ago, we couldn't have forecast where we would be today. You know, here we are. Yeah. And can't forecast necessarily where we'll be 25 years from now. Uh, I have a pretty good idea where I'll be 25 years from now, but let's not <laughs> talk about that. <laughs> I thought you were talking about the market. That. I thought you were talking about the market, not us. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's all the same thing. And so I tell people, you know, you look, you know more about investing than you think you know. Just learn how to yeah. deal with uncertainty. And now let's pause for a moment and think about how did you deal with uncertainty? You know, give me an example, a story about you know, a tough decision you had to make, you know, full of uncertainty, but where the outcome was really important uh and where it worked out I, I i did this um exercise actually last thanksgiving with my kids i said uh and they're plus ones um thanksgiving dinner bring me an example of just what i talked about it how you dealt with a major problem dealt with uncertainty yep. and uh how it worked out and what you're able to do in, in, in that kind of context, if you play that kind of game, it, it turns out the way you dealt with uncertainty is the way you uh, in life is kind of the way you deal with it in investing. You know, you um, you have an idea of what where you're where you're headed. Uh, that's different than a prediction. You don't try to predict things. You plan for things. You don't try to predict things too much. Right. Have as much information as you can. But that's. Uh, that's the first step, because when I talk to clients, frequently they come and go, They're, the market was up, up a lot last year. What should I do? Or the market was down a lot last year. What should I do? Well, probably most, uh, most of the time, you don't need to do anything except rebalance, maybe. Um, but you don't, uh, the market, the fundamental belief that we all share is the market is inherently unpredictable. So why waste a whole lot of time trying to predict the unpredictable? You know, that's not the way you go through life. You make sensible decisions, you look at the outcome, and then you adapt. And if you do that, with, and that's where your help comes in, if you do that over time, your clients, by the time, let's say retirement is a goal, that's why they're investing, retirement income. By the time they hit retirement, if you behave sensibly along the way, you're probably going to be you're probably going to be fine. 
Yeah. So that's what life is about. There you go. I, I love that. So you talked a lot about this uh, uncertainty, and recently you did a full article on this, I, and you kind of touched on it, but maybe you could expand on this idea that without uncertainty, we really wouldn't have an expected return on our investments. Maybe from right. a T-bill from a T-bill to emerging market small or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I think uh, um, if in, in, if markets were predictable, uh, or individual stock returns were predictable, um, then we know what the what the return would be. Uh, it'd be the treasury bill return, something similar, like a riskless asset return, because there's no risk. So, yeah. And that's kind of going back to flip back back into life, you know. Um, a lot of the joy in life are the things you you tried, you didn't know would work out, and they did, and that's that's how you grow. That's right. That's how you get the benefit of compounding. You know, all these decisions you make, you are the result of the compounding of all these decisions you made over your lifetime. You know, uh, I think you often quote out Einstein saying that compounding is the eighth wonder of the world, or whatever. Yeah. I think it's exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's true of life in general. And in fact, I even, I suspect that's where wisdom comes from is the compounding of, if, uh, of all the decisions, some that work out well, some that not so well, you know, uh, whatever, but that's, that's what, uh, that's what investing is about. And that's how you, you get through life. So the central proposition here really is if you manage uncertainty better, you will perform better in life, and in investing. Um, you know, an, an, uh, an example that Bob Merton uses sometimes is, um, you know, Bob is our resident scientist, you know, Nobel right. winning uh, prize winner. Um, he says, you know, um, you can't predict the weather just like you can't predict markets. And so you have an umbrella. Sometimes you carry it, sometimes you don't. You have weather forecasts and you may believe them or not. Sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. So sometimes you carry an umbrella and you didn't need to, and other times you didn't carry it and you should have. I mean, right. That's life. It's managing that process, managing that uncertainty. Uh, that's an example of what we mean by managing uncertainty. Um, right. without, and central to all this as well is that you can have a great experience without predicting. You know, when people, you know, I, usually if I go on some... TV show or something. They, you know, before going on, I say, don't ask me what where the market's going. I don't know. And you get on, first thing they ask you is, what do you like now? You know, what do you think? Yeah, what, should, what should you do now? What should you do now? And uh, uh, well, so whatever. I mean, that's the. Uh, it's what they're there for. Right. As that's as um, uh, in the Godfather, they say, that's the business we've chosen, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, that's yeah. That's the beauty of all this. But and here again, life would be not that interesting if everything were predictable. I mean, it is. So the thing we shrink away from is the thing uh, that probably makes life uh, worthwhile. You just have to manage the process. It's not predicting markets. It's managing the process. You know, that's there's no magic. Um, you know, and but if you do it right, then over the long haul, with your clients, what happens is they eventually develop a lot of trust in the process because you have sensible ideas and you would adapt to their needs. And after a while, you know, people go uh, feel confident. Like this lady, we did over here, one of your clients say exactly that. I mean, right. Right. that's... Uh, that's what it's all about. So, you know, when I think about that uncertainty, it also reminds me of the price. Uh, I like to tell the story. If you had an investment and it, it was $100 and there was a 100% certainty that a year from now, it would be 120 okay? Uh, you know, what price would you charge me today for that investment, it would be $120. Maybe, you know, there's always yeah, a little 100, 130, 116, but if, 117, whatever short term. Whatever, time. something very yeah. close to the 120. Right. And so what does that mean to my return now? It's basically going to be zero. 
because there was a hundred percent or ninety nine percent certainty, whatever the number right. down the road, and so the price is is really important. In fact, that comes back to the so called joint hypothesis, which I always find is interesting. That prices need to be fair, and when they are, then risk and return are related. If they weren't right. fair, then it would leave opportunity for all these active investors whose real job it is to discover mispriced securities. I like that more and more when I talk about active and passive now is to uh, have a discussion with, with clients about the idea of how likely is it that securities are underpriced or overpriced given so many people on both sides of the trade. Yeah, what, you know, uh, people often lose sight of what's going on in markets. It's where buyers and sellers come together. The buyers are trying to buy it at the lowest price. The sellers are trying to sell at the highest price. Right. And eventually, they come to uh, an agreement on price, and both of them feel like they got a good deal, or they wouldn't trade, at, in a, at least in a voluntary transaction. That's all that's going on. Um, right. And so when you have millions of people, you know, the, it's kind of the wisdom of crowds thing, uh, you know. Uh, yep. Uh, everybody coming in, you, you can say each side's trying to take advantage of the other, but when you have, when you don't have control over that, the evidence is that the, that price is fair to both sides. It is. And and that uh, sets, sets up two fair things, the cost of capital for the seller right. and the expected return for the buyer. Bingo. I like to think that the price is simultaneously setting these two. And so uh, that was part of Merton Miller's Nobel Prize, I think, right? The yeah, cost right. of capital. And maybe we could talk about that for just a second, because that's another concept I always try to get into with clients. It's a little difficult. But to me, the, the number one do, thing is to think about both sides of the trade, as you just laid out. And most of the time, we're thinking about the return or the loss for the buyer and not really thinking about the high cost of capital or the low cost of capital for the seller. And I don't know if you saw Marlena Lee just did a little piece oh, right. about the Magnificent Seven and they've had these huge returns and all that sounds wonderful, except for the seller <laughs> who had a whatever 100% cost of capital because they took cash for their shares. So uh, maybe you could put it into your words, you know, and, and how you think about uh, cost of capital equals uh, expected return. By the way, I printed that on the top of the Galton board, right in the center, uh, just so people won't forget that as they're flipping that Galton board that I had sent you here. <laughs> it's got a, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. right at the very top there, you there see yeah. the return. Uh, for the buyer equals the cost of the capital for the yeah. seller. Yeah. yeah, when a company issues stock to investors, yeah. they have to promise them a fair return or people won't buy. Uh, that's the fundamental thing to keep in mind about investing, say, in stocks or bonds, just uh, publicly traded, um, that it has to be set at a price that induces people to come in and invest. Otherwise... You wouldn't companies wouldn't be able to raise capital, you know. Uh, right. Right. So, what is the fair return? Well, to quote uh, Merton Miller, cost of capital is, and when he when he starts to speak, since he got his Nobel Prize on this subject, everybody's listening very carefully. He goes, "The cost of capital is ten percent." <laughs> People go, "That's it?" No, That's it. what it means is we don't really know what the cost, but it's the expect. So you'll never know for sure what it is. But if prices are being set, then fairly, then what you would observe is that companies that you think of as being riskier um, would have a higher average return than the stocks of companies that are uh, less risky. Right. So um, when you see the Magnificent Seven, let's say a stock had a 100% return, as you pointed out, uh, the seller, whoever sold that stock a year ago, you know, he's not so happy. One hundred percent. That opportunity cost is a big. Some maybe the next interview we can cover 
opportunity cost because that's uh, right. really one of the you know uh, one of the most understood themes. Anyway, so that's um, the question is then is why would the cost of capital be so high for the Magnificent Seven? Well, the answer is it isn't that. Yeah. Uh, what you're observing is unexpected returns. Uh, um, if the going back to prediction, if those returns could have been predicted to be a hundred percent, investors would have um, bid up the price. Or stated differently, maybe you give a black eye to the company because um, during this big run up in technology, these technology companies are issuing lots of stock. Why are they issuing stock at prices that give investors a hundred percent return? I don't right. <laughs> so they didn't know about it either. It just right. Uh, sometimes life turns out to be better. I mean, uh, going back to life examples, sometimes those tough decisions you made turned out to be golden. <laughs> yeah. You know, in hindsight, you didn't know for sure, but it, everything really worked out well. You know, you got to celebrate those times. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, I, I wrote an article on some like March of 2020. That was when the Fang stocks had been. Uh, doing 30% a year for 10 years. I pointed right. out, hey, look, Tesla last year, he's one of the FANG stocks. It, it it had three stock offerings last year. What's what's it doing offering? You know? So, um, yeah, that's what, but once people understand that, there's a sensible relation between risk and return, cost of capital and your return. It's, um, but um, to your point, I think investors, when they come in, with a lot of anxiety about last year's return, either being good or bad. Um, you have to point out, do you think that's a sensible, last year's return is a sensible uh, measure of cost of capital? Right. No, no. <laughs> it's not. So, it's uh, not. <laughs> so here we are, our business is largely talking about unexpected returns. I yeah. mean, that's people, that's all they want to talk about. Let's say we oh. knew and we don't know this, but suppose the cost of capital is 10% for all companies. Just then whatever return you got last year that was different from 10% is the amount of unexpected return you got. Exactly. Good or bad. Sorry. So, no, that's good. I, I, I just wanted to, to expand on that a little bit because I remember early on in a FAMA interview, he, he talked about the expected value. Well, that's a statistical term. And when you're talking about the market, it's the expected return. That is the value yeah, right. that you're talking about. But think about what that is. Historically, if you look at a large sample or a large distribution of returns, that expected value is the mean, the middle point of that large distribution. and. Right. What you can see when you look at this Galton board is all the unexpected returns. It's only yeah. down the middle that's the expected. And so that's why I love this tool. It can teach people so many aspects of the statistical parts of the analysis of the market, which, by the way, and I also remind people, the statistics only applies because the price is fair. Right. If the price wasn't fair, you wouldn't have this, you know, close to a normal distribution. The tails are a little fat, but when you when you do it monthly and you do it highly diversified, it's pretty darn close to the normal distribution. But you you none of this would apply if the f price wasn't fair on an ongoing basis. So anyway, well, that's right. And how do we? The other part of the is the price fair. Is all the research into the into the performance of of the managers that try to outguess the market? And right. To quote Fama, looks pretty random. Yes. You know, before fees, after fees, it looks horrible. I think that's paraphrasing what he said, but that's so. All that points to um, the marketplace with these millions of investors, each of them trying to work on the gain the slightest advantage. You know the. The cumulative effect of all that is you can sit back and relax because the market, all these participants are knocking themselves out. They're working for you to establish a fair price. Right. That's about as good as it gets. You know, there's been some criticism lately. You might have seen it about uh, passive investing. Uh, that is one that 
has been, I've heard it for 25 years, that we're kind of riding on the coattails, if you will, of these active traders who are helping establish the fair price. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, it could be uh, to extent uh, in these trade. Look, it's perfectly consistent with efficient markets to say that a good trader can do a better job than a bad trader. That's why people, I think one of the reasons they benefit from investing with us. So we have this enormous infrastructure for trading that, right. uh, yep. um, that you can't get on your own. If you go out willy nilly and just say, look, uh, uh, give me a trade on the at the market, whatever that is, which is what you're going to get if you go through any of the brokers that are selling your uh, your trades. Uh, you're going to get um, a market price, um, and that will be set against you because uh, there's a, there's this bid ask spread. I mean, yeah, brokers say, "Well, I will sell you the stock for ten dollars and a nickel, and, or I'll buy from you for ten dollars, uh, or whatever the spread is." You know, that adds up. And then if, um, so that's what you have to worry about. So professional traders, to, to the extent you have high frequency traders, maybe they can make a little bit of extra money. Um, now, hold on, because the second part of it is, suppose you could identify one of those traders. What are they going to charge you for that? I mean, you have... You know, one of these firms, Renaissance, you know, for years had these right. extraordinary returns. The last yes. I saw, they were charging 5% plus half of the upside or something. 50. Yeah, yeah, 5 and 50, yeah. Yeah, so, I Two mean, 20s out the, the window. If they're, smart, if they're that rare firm that yes. uh, can actually do it consistently, why would they cut you in on any of the vigorous, you know? I mean, so you have to have two things. You have to identify that high-frequency trader. Um, and then hope that they don't they aren't smart enough to figure out how to raise their prices. That's as you were talking about that. The, yeah, that, that dog don't hunt, you know. I mean, that's uh, <laughs> that's the null as, set. As you were talking about that, I was reminded, I think it was Donald Kine that did an early paper on your implementation of right. the 910 microcap fund in the very beginning. And I as I recall, many Academics felt that you couldn't capture these excess returns of small caps because of the trading cost. Right. And I think he was involved and maybe several other people in this idea of, in the beginning, it was a block trading. I don't know where it's evolved to now, but basically a, a modified version of managing a set of rules of ownership, I like to call it, for, for an index that took into consideration these all-important trading costs. And I think that has been a hallmark of your different, differential from firms like Vanguard and, and BlackRock and many of these other firms. Well, that, that leads into the issue of labels. <laughs> yes, it does. I, I think the way to think of us is we're... Um, Passive in the sense that uh, we don't try to outguess the market, but right. we're very active on trading and execution because yep. that's that says a good trader can do a better job than a bad trader. Yes. I don't think anybody would argue with that. You know, yep. if you if you go in or sloppy and not paying attention to what's going on, um, I mean, I have a story about that. I was sitting, I was our first portfolio manager, and I was sitting on the trading desk. Now, keep in mind that's now forty-two years ago. <laughs> And yeah. um, in the brownstone, <laughs> in the rooms, yeah, right. In my spare bedroom, you know, I was, I was our chief systems programmer and our chief trader and uh, our uh, portfolio manager. And uh, anyway, I'm sitting on the desk and um, I get a, a phone call from a broker saying, "I just want to tell you the story." It was about this uh, index fund manager um, that uh, listed the trades he wanted to make. Uh, you know. Uh, uh, you know, on, on the internet. Um, and um, this manager had listed uh, Braniff. I don't know if you remember Braniff. That was an airline yeah. with yeah many different colored airplanes. 
Right, know? right, Braniff, yeah. Uh, and I uh, said it wanted to buy Braniff. And it turns out Braniff declared that day um, bankruptcy. Wow. <laughs> so uh, the um, this broker called up uh, the index fund manager and said, look, I just want you to know you're, you're saying you're willing to buy Braniff. I just want to let you know Braniff just declared bankruptcy. And the index manager said, look, if the algorithm says we want to buy Braniff, we want to buy Braniff. He said, okay, right. you just bought 100,000 shares. You know? <laughs> so uh, that's uh, that's the, that's the kind of thing. Just because sure. you think prices are fair, I mean, they may not be fair to you because unless you know what you're doing, you know, you may get, yeah. it, as they say, you may get your eyes ripped out, you know, on the execution. So, yeah, I think there were, as I recall, 13 rules of exclusion right. uh, that had to do with uh, certain securities in the early days that probably uh, that was one of them. <laughs> if, you, if you declare bankruptcy, that's not a good idea. Yeah, not a good idea. <clears throat> Ken French actually said, um, you know, when we started, we made up a whole bunch of a trading rules. Right. And why did we make up trading rules? Because we're largely trading against people that might have information. It doesn't, there's no, nothing in the fish and market says there's no information out there. It says no prices move to reflect available information. So there are people out there that have information. They just don't have enough uh, to make a round trip, round trip trade. Uh, so you got to be very careful going to the marketplace. And so we made up a number of rules of what, for example, first thing we do is we look if there's any news items about the stock <laughs> before right. we trade. I mean, that seems kind of sensible. Um, yeah. And we uh, check if there's been any uh, announcements about mergers or uh, bankruptcy or whatever kinds of uh, capital structure changes um, that, that might say that the price discovery thing is going on in the market. So we look at a whole bunch of these things. Well, it turns out Ken French said those most of those rules we made up subsequently were researched and shown to be very effective if that's the way you want to go about trading it. Right. And, and uh, you've seen the results of that fund. It just had its 42nd anniversary. Um, wow. And its performance after fees, you know, very impressive. Yeah. So what it shows is you can be passive on trying to you can you can get you don't have to try to out predict the market and you can still beat an index if you can trade better than uh, the prices that are in the index uh, so that's that's how we approached it and um, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean you have to have rare insights it just as you have there are techniques of trading and dealing with they call it market microstructure there are things you can do to improve uh, outcomes. And that's yep. how we differentiate ourselves from straight index funds. Yes. And keep in mind, I worked on the first index fund in 1971. Right. God, it's hard to believe 50, whatever. At Wells Fargo. Yeah. Yeah. Not 52 years ago. We've learned a lot since then. In fact, you know, I might, if, if you have time, just I tell a little story about that first. Yeah. And Mac. Yeah. Mac McQuown. <clears throat> Mac ran this thing called the uh, Management Sciences Department at Wells Fargo Bank in San Francisco. Right. It was kind of what you would call it in those days referred to as a think tank. And eventually Myron Scholes and Fisher Black persuaded him to come out to the bank should have offer um, uh, indexing. Um, and so that led to two different approaches. <laughs> at the same right. time, they had the S, uh, the trust department that decided to come out with the S&P 500 index fund, which it did. And that eventually, Wells Fargo sold that business off and so forth. It's been sold. Eventually, it ends up being the antecedent to BlackRock's iShares. Yeah, it's that right. same. That's the history of, of that path. Yep. Yeah, isn't that interesting? The management size, <laughs> we came out with a we worked with Myron and, and Fisher to come up with a different strategy. Um, it was, we thought, number one, we needed to engineer portfolios at a higher expected return than the market. Um, that was based on the work by Bob Merton, the multi-factor theory. There are uh, 
uh, slices, sleeves of the market that have higher expected returns than others. So we wanted, we figured we could do that. Um, the second part was, and this comes from the, the Black Shoals Merton option pricing model, which says flexibility has economic value. Okay. So that what that meant was we wanted to be flexible in trading and flexible in design. Uh, indexing is the opposite end of that. It's a hundred percent mechanical, a hundred percent rigid. It says flexibility has no value. Uh, right. That's index funds. Yeah. So turns out selling the uh, S and P five hundred idea was much simpler, and that took off like a like a rocket. Right. The, uh, the portfolio was designed for the Samsonite account, kind of languished, and eventually we all split up. But that led to the creation. 10 years later, of dimensional. Uh, and we still believe all of our portfolios are, you can think of all of our equity portfolios as being market portfolios. I mean, right. kind of Fama's view of what a market portfolio is, something that holds hundreds, maybe thousands of stocks. That's a market portfolio. Right. Our portfolio, we have a small market portfolio, a small value portfolio, a large value, a market market portfolio. We, we have all kinds of market portfolios, but each of them is engineered to have a higher expected return than its benchmark index. Right. The second point uh, is that then it comes in execution. And here again, consistent with option pricing, flexibility has value. If we take advantage of flexibility, uh, then we can add value. So those are the two sources, being sure. flexible on design and flexible in execution. It's it's based on science. It's just if you're selling, it's just like selling pharmaceuticals. I mean, this is what the, this is what the science shows. Science, know, all the all the <laughs> support. You know, it's uh, you know the other thing I like to weave into that story a little bit is these research indexes that you can find on Ken French's website that Fama and French uh, utilize in their asset pricing model, and I often like to say that. Uh, Fama and French's approach to an index was different from Russell and S&P and Dow because those were just, they were really just cuts of the market where, right. where uh, Fama and French were focused on dimensions of the market that had higher uh, historical returns to develop this set of, of of companies that based on certain characteristics that would allow you to put together a index that's more for investing than just looking at the largest you know 500 companies or whatever it might be or slicing the market from 3000 companies in russell to say oh the top thousands are large and the bottom 2000 are small uh instead of looking at it that way these research indexes were focused on maximizing returns based on these characteristics. And that's another important element that I like to discuss anyway, relative to uh, your overall strategy and, and what goes into your design. Well, no, that's right. I mean, basically, in essence, what Fama and French try to do is estimate the cost of capital of a company. <laughs> yeah. Getting back to our previous discussion. Yeah, yeah. previous discussion. And their multi-factor model, if you went to business school now, people would use that um, their multi-factor model to uh, estimate the cost of capital for a company. So, That's right. When they when they came out originally, uh, of course, you know, all this brilliant research you know, initially gets poo-pooed. <laughs> uh, people, uh, I don't know. Anyway... Um, and that's your secret sauce was taking this academic research and turning it in to a financial solution or a, or a product, right? Yeah, right. You know, uh, and keep in mind, the S&P 500 index fund is always the easiest thing to explain. So we've yeah. chosen a path that's more difficult to explain to people, but and produces better returns, we think, um, and has returned better returns. The, yes, uh, yes. And so I tell people, I'd rather have that. I'd rather have something that's more difficult to explain, but it's the right thing to do 
rather than having something that's easy to explain, that's not so good. You know, so. so David, I think we had a pause a moment. Something's just occurred to me that, you know, we've just been covering all these numerous topics and we've thrown out four Nobel Prize winners' names uh, that you have worked with <laughs> in, in all cases before they earned their Nobel Prize. There, there was and, one uh, exception. Bob Merton already had his. But, okay. Uh, he joined the... Uh, Mer Merton Miller, one of the original independent directors of the Mutual Fund, right, died in 2000, and uh, unfortunately, and and was associated. So, uh, Bob Merton came in and took his his place. Huh. Right, right. I mean, I couldn't believe it, but but by that time, you know, we had been in business almost 30 years, and and uh, no, I guess 20 years, and um, so I was surprised that Bob would be willing to be an independent director, but he was. And by the way, we added a fifth. December before last, when uh, Doug Diamond got his Nobel, been, uh, yeah. he'd been he's he was our lead independent director, or still is, of the for the mutual fund. So five laureates, four of which you might uh, consider to be the lead independent directors of, of the mutual fund, and um, uh, one Obama uh, main independent director, or an independent director of the for the advisor. Dimensional. I so, remember meeting uh, Doug Diamond when I came to present to your mutual fund board. I don't know if you remember that. Right. Your your board wanted to understand what uh, advisors like me were telling clients. Right. And I remember going through a bunch of charts there and Myron Scholes asking a lot of questions, <laughs> which was which was kind of interesting. I'm going, okay, I'm defending myself against this Nobel laureate here. <laughs> Well, which, I, I'm, I'm, which was I'm, fun for me. It is fun, and we selected you because um, we think what you do is uh, is very sensible. And I can share with you, running that gauntlet uh, isn't always fun. But uh, you know, <clears throat> my side of it is, who would you like to have monitor our results, other than, more than a group of Nobel laureates? They're the exactly. ideal people to monitor to make sure we're doing what we said we would do. You know, and that's has been a big help to us over the last 42 years. Yes. This gets back to my book. It was one of the things I wanted to talk to you about today. I actually have three major things. We've, we've almost talked an hour, but let's try to get to these. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the subtitle of my book has to do with, the, it's called the 12-Step Recovery Program for Active Investors. Yeah. Are you we, from we, this we, book? Next yeah. Months. yeah. yeah. By the yeah. way, the SEC classifies index funds into two categories, the what I'll call the traditional index fund and these non-traditional. And the non-traditional actually includes factor funds in there, and they discuss even you know social filters and environmental filters, which you guys also do. The uh, uh, What's interesting is in a traditional 12-step program, th this has to do with the fact that the market can be like a casino for a lot of people, and especially when prices are fair, like the dice is fair and the spin of the roulette wheel is fair, it is a can generate a form of addictive behavior uh, by traders. And in fact, there's two therapists I know who specialize in dealing with stock market gamblers, we call them. But in the 12-step program, the second step, after, you, you know, rec after you've admitted that you have an issue, with uh, whatever your addiction is, is to find a higher power. And I identified that higher power as those individuals who had earned these Nobel Prizes. And I remember looking into this and seeing that there are, I think, 1,500 academics that end up voting on who earns this Nobel Prize and what a uh, really monumental feat it is to collect a lifetime of research results or or papers that position you for that. And of course, Harry Markowitz uh, was one of the original. In fact, I heard just recently that Fama took Markowitz's book as his first class, and and they just basically went through Markowitz's book. And as you see, he wrote the intro to my book, and uh, he consulted with us for I don't know seven years, and we we lost him last year. Right. Uh, 
And the other thing I noticed about Markowitz is you have that little sort of historical display and in, in the little plastic uh, containers on your wall. And it all starts with uh, Harry Markowitz in that top left corner. Right. Uh, and, any thoughts on Harry and, and what that meant to Dimensional? Well, yeah, I mean, um, before 1950, for sure. Um, uh, if you think about finance, the field of finance and investing, there was nothing but darkness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have, <laughs> yeah in, in that dark world, you know, you have brokers and money managers claiming all sorts of things. And they could claim all sorts of things because they had, there was there was no data, no really no theory. Uh, right. Uh, the um, so it started to change. Uh, Harry um, really was a catalyst on the theory side. Of, uh, um, I get a kick out of. I read his Nobel uh, speech acceptance speech. Talk uh -huh. about you know. Is he was in the PhD program at, at Chicago and uh, he was trying to figure out something and do you want to do something in investing? He said, Well, you know, and sit in the library, which brings back memories to me. Uh, right. And uh, said, uh, You know, people aren't in, they're interested more than just stocks that have the, I think, will have the highest return. Because uh, of the, if that's what they were concerned with. They'd only hold one stock. So okay. why would they hold lots of stocks? He goes, variance came to mind. Now, I don't know how many people would sit in a library and think that variance came to mind, but that right. set, set him down a path, um, a very sensible path, a way of, art, way of framing the argument that eventually when the data became available, people would start testing a lot of these things. Now, his efficient frontier wasn't... Um, all that practical because you have so many covariances you have to estimate. And but based on that, people then said, okay, well, here's how to deal with Harry's work. Uh, here's how to streamline um, the work at well, uh, the capital asset pricing model. And with those two things in you know in place, then um and the whole field took off. You know, uh yep. With that we we rely heavily on the science as as do you the science of investing yep have a science you have to have empirical you have to have hypotheses and empirical data to test those hypotheses if you don't have those things you don't have a science you have beliefs and it's a waste of time to argue beliefs in the in the stock market i mean people want to come up to me all the time and give, give me their hunches about where the market's going i go oh man do i have to listen to this <laughs> yes. You know, that was one of my questions, and I, I kind of put it off because I didn't, wasn't sure I'd like to get into it because it's complex, but I'm going to take a shot at this. You bring up this empirical evidence, and and literally every paper that gets published gets gets tested and checked on its statistics of the data they presented. And a key number in there is what's called the T-statistic. And uh, really has to do with, uh, I guess, statistical significance is another way to phrase that. But I can't tell you how many DFA conferences I sat through, David, and saw all these numbers. And at the end, it had that little T-stat there. Yeah. And, and uh, it took me a long time. I finally asked uh, Brad Steinman who runs your Canadian operation because he's a statistician and an economist. I had, I had heard that. I said, would you do me a little write up or try to explain to me why this T statistic is so important in first looking at data, but also in looking at managers performance. And he did this great write up on the, the T stat of the alpha, which is the excess return of the manager. And uh, I remember at a dinner, you just rattled off the, the T-stat formula because it's so important to you. And also, I don't know how many years ago, this idea of you know a chance outcome. In fact, I, I heard uh, Merton Miller talk about this in a PBS movie years ago. You know, if you got 10,000 traders out there out of chance alone, one of them is going to end up being a winner. But 
do you think we it's even worth trying to talk about this? I, I, what I was going to say is this concept of luck versus skill, I think is really important for investors to think about because in almost every case, they look at somebody who's shot the lights out in the market as having some skill and have somehow forgot about the idea that they could have just gotten lucky. Well, no, that's that's right. I mean, go back to your uh, normal distribution, the curve that you right. use with all. You yeah. Know, what a T-statistic does is say, uh, is that uh, um, that mean that you talk about, which is about plus 10 or 11%, you know, um, is that uh, due to chance? Uh, and the T-statistic statistic would say it's highly unlikely that you would get that kind of result if, uh, if it was due to chance. If it was that's due to yeah. So that's, um, and it has to do with, uh, you know, the variability, standard deviation, you know, divided by the square root of the number of observations, if that means yeah. anything yeah. to you. But it's, uh, um, and here's the rub though, even the t if T-statistic suggests that something may be uh, systematic, uh, it doesn't mean uh, like it doesn't a skill. how big yeah. it is. It just means the test is it's not zero. Uh, that's right. the other rub. So even though like the small cap premium we think is there, uh, right. uh, there's no way of knowing exactly how big it is. Uh, we can measure historically. Well, we, yeah, we looked at, so so let's go back to the alpha, the excess return over a benchmark that you know, managers are trying to earn by their stock picking. Let's say they're compared to the S&P 500 and they're buying 100 stocks and trying to outperform it. And you know they earned 1% over one year and they 3% under the next year. And so this, this uh, excess return or alpha has an average, as you said, it has this variability. It's it's not a Madoff number where it's the same <laughs> excess return all the time. And and then it has a, a sample size. And so I'm trying to get people to understand this concept of luck. And one way I found this quite effective is actually show the alpha year by year and in many cases, it's one huge alpha over a 20-year period, right. and then nothing else. <laughs> well, what you would find is, based on the work of Fallon and French, they did this study a few years ago. Can right. you pull up your uh, your normal yeah. curve again? Okay, we think of um, uh, the, the right side as being positive, and the, if you go to the, to the left, uh, that's a negative return. Right. If you... What uh, Fama and French found, if you, if you plotted out the, uh, the alphas, the alpha T statistics, as you point out, it, the curve would look like that, only it would be shifted to the left. Uh, in other words, right. the right tail of the uh, manager's T statistic would look like the left tail uh, of, of this histogram. So right. uh, it says, yeah, there, there are a few managers that do have exceptional returns, they're just fewer than we expect by chance. Uh, that's yeah. uh, that's the upshot of it all. And that's all right. And, and furthermore, as a result, we don't know how to identify these managers in, in advance. Right. That's the only thing that counts. Can you identify these managers? Nobody knows how. Um, there's no evidence of figuring out who's yeah, going it, to be the next winner. I always like to ask people, how long of a track record do you think we would need to be confident that somebody's alpha was not zero, okay, based on the past data. And if we look at over the 20 year periods, all the active managers who had a positive alpha, and we just kind of took the average, it's about one, one and a half percent, but it has this huge variation, uh, the alpha of like seven or eight. So you need 120 years for the of data for the average manager who had a positive alpha. And yeah, therein exactly. lies the problem because returns are so noisy right. and alphas are so noisy, you basically don't have enough live data to hardly make any conclusions, which is why you go back and look at long-term index data that gives you some uh, analysis that looks at the character, a relatively constant 
relative characteristic of these firms. I say relative because, you know, all the small companies for, you know, 95 years relative to all the other ones. Okay, let's talk about the film that attempted to summarize all of this. Yeah, right. <laughs> We've been talking about. In fact, I think Harry was mentioned in there like three or four times. Harry. Oh, Marco. yeah, right. No, he's everybody. Realized yeah. him. He was he was the catalyst. What does this title mean? And I think you said it in the film, and that's probably where they came up. Maybe we should back up. This is a film about, I would say, passive investing first, but secondly, about the individuals who ended up uh, creating dimensional fund advisors, but all started from, you know, different places. And as we said, many of them ended up with Nobel Prizes. And maybe give us a little history as to even how this came about. And, and then let's talk about the filming of it and Errol Morris a little bit. Yeah, we approached Errol Morris. Um, we had an idea of, um, rough idea of, uh, I would like to have the story told somehow about the history of these ideas. Mm -hmm. And Errol, uh, he got his Academy Award for The Fog of War, which is a good movie if you haven't. It's on Netflix, I think. It's, I saw it, yeah. It's a uh, Robert he really got in. So he uh, is highly regarded. And the more he learned about our firm, the, and uh, the more he really got into it. And as I've always told people, the ideas around which we built the firm are much bigger than the firm itself. Yes. <laughs> and that's what he really got into is the science, how this science got developed. I mean, if you look at the six Nobel laureates we've talked about today, five of which have been closely associated with us, one closely associated, closely associated with you. Yeah. Um, if you took those six people out, the field of finance would look a lot different. <laughs> you know, I mean, these are, and uh, we were able to still get, um, you know, interviews, personal stories, and that's that's what really makes it come alive for people. That's this uh, here again, the lady that said, you know, my my husband really does all the financing, all finance stuff for the for us. But watching that movie made me feel safe. It's because these guys uh, can articulate um, the science, the background of what it really means without getting into these statistics, and heteroscedasticity, right. or what else, whether <laughs> any other statistical term you want you know it's uh these are right. real people came up with ideas that change the world and improve people's lives you look at your clients are getting a much better deal than uh some their parents did 50 years ago or grandparents uh, oh. the costs were just so much higher and people knew so little about investing and diversification risk control you know um so it's it. Now that I've been involved in the business for 52 years, you know, I, I'm glad somebody's telling the story. And I, I've had a rough time personally trying to tell that story. Um, it's so exciting the development of all these ideas, and I think Errol right. Morris did a good job. And hopefully, within the next month or two, we'll be able to get have your clients get access to it. Um, yes. um, you know, the Oscars Oscars are coming up. I heard you were up for Best Actor. Well, it's because, yeah, right. That's, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I turned it down. I, 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 I'm going for Best Supporting Actor. Okay, no. good. <laughs> it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very meaningful. But I mean, that really tells the story. This stuff is meaningful. It's yes. not just that they good research. It's right. improved people's lives. They're living better in retirement because of these ideas. You know, that sort of yeah. thing. You know, so uh, I just, just to make it clear here, we're there, I think there were 15 people who were interviewed for this film, as you see here. And it was a great honor for you guys to ask me to participate in that. And it was, it was really an interesting experience. Uh, I think we came to your house, actually, and, and went to your garage. Yeah, and right. I sat in this this 
kind of dark room with all these curtains. And I'm looking at this kind of teleprompter. And then all of a sudden, there comes Errol Morris's face in the teleprompter, which right. was this, uh, in Terratron, which was something that he actually, I guess, I don't know if he invented, he invented it. Yeah. Certainly, it yeah, he, he made it popular. And, and I heard 60 Minutes, a lot of other shows now, uh, copy uh, his techniques. But I thought it was quite interesting because it made you look, you know, right into the camera, which is sometimes a problem with our Zoom, by right. the way. You got to look right into the camera and and you never really see Errol. But that makes sense if you think about it. People don't want to see the person who's doing the interviewing as much as they want to see who's being interviewed. And so I thought that was amazing. And then he traveled all over the place. Go ahead. Were you going to say something about the no, film? No, I do. Well, I mean, it's a credit to you. I mean, uh, because not only did you do the interview, you made it into the film. We had he, several people interviewed that were, didn't make the cut. I mean, you know, I, so, heard, uh, I heard that. You. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's because I they loved the story that I lost. Uh, and I had a big opportunity cost because I, I didn't properly passively manage my portfolio after I sold my company. So I think that that had an interesting impact. But, you know, that was a huge driver for me doing this because I had my own personal experience of totally messing up my, my windfall that I earned at a very young age. So, okay. So 25 years uh, is coming up for IFA. And I was thinking back 25 years ago, uh, after I met Sam Adams, I decided to get involved and learn more about dimensional. And to my surprise, and, and maybe get my clients involved in it, just my, to my surprise, I was told, oh, you can't just go buy these funds. You have to come to a conference. And I think we ended up going to the hotel. What was that? What's the hotel there down the street? Uh, yeah, the Fair uh, Miramont. The Fairmont. Yeah, the Fairmont. And I remember sitting in there early on and listening to you and Rex Singfield, all the, all the people that are in the film, Weston Wellington, uh, and, and you guys telling, really educating us. I felt like I was going to a, a class at the University of Chicago. <laughs> yeah, the Any thoughts times. on those early days? I think you had about $28 billion, if I'm not mistaken. That's probably about right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, the difference is um, at the University of Chicago, it's unlikely to get an A. Uh, that's our job is to make sure you get the A. Uh, I, that's what I tell Fama. You know, Fama, you know, you teach and you give kids any kind of grades, and you don't, uh, and that's it. You know, we don't we don't win unless you get an A. <laughs> right. So um, anyway, you got the A. Oh, that's so funny. Uh, I have to tell you, it was so refreshing to go to these because there was so little sales going on. It was just literally, you were there to learn about markets. And occasionally we would hear a little bit about a dimensional fund or, or what some return was of some fund, but it was rarely spoken about even, let alone made the highlight. And later I attended other firms little, you know, conferences, and you're barraged with that. And I like to say that some of your competitors, I, I felt like I was literally in grade school versus being at a university course <laughs> at yours. And that is a huge tribute and compliment to you and the team that you assembled to carry this out. So thank you for that. Well, it's a comp. Thank you. It's a really a complex subject. And you know, here again, dealing with uncertainty. I think that one of the reasons uh, you don't see a strong sales pitch is we realize all these things, you know, uh, even the research, you know, uh, going back to drawing on pharmaceuticals, sometimes the medicine, the pill doesn't work, you know, I mean, and so you have to always be vigilant and, um, you know, updating and doing an experiment, finding out what the, what the model of that person is that would make them better. One of the things I wanted to do was go back in time, or what I like to call the Wayback Machine, and look at where these indexes were 
when we started, which actually was the day I incorporated, which was March 5th of 1999, and see how they had changed over those years. And at first, I was pretty impressed to see that the S&P 500 was at 1275. And today, I think it's like 40, uh, I was just looking at it up there. I think it's 4960 already. This is uh, uh, already, uh, this is at year end. To my surprise, and, and that growth was 5.5%. To my surprise, what I really found out is that the S&P 500 should be 22,346 because this first number did not include the dividends. And that was an annualized return of 5.55% on the price only S&P, but it turns out it's actually 754 And so that's shocking to me that the financial media all goes with and, and stays with this price only return. Do you have any ideas how we can get them to switch to the no. total return? Look, it doesn't make uh, some things I realize are just not going to happen in my lifetime. And one of that's one of them. The other one is, why does even why does anybody even look at the Dow? I mean, yeah, that uh, is so unrepresentative of anything. I mean, the S and P five hundred is you know not a bad thing to look that's at. That's a little better. Yeah, it's that's better, at least yeah. five hundred. Yeah. So that goes back into why the name of the movie is Tune Out the Noise. And you just, you know, people are out there, the financial services industry, by and large, is a year to get to get you to trade, you know. Yes. And uh, and whatever they can do to get you to trade, that's what they're that's what they're gonna do. So they're gonna as you mentioned, we we sell through education. Most of the people, most financial services are pushing products. Uh yeah. We're selling an overall experience, life, a lifetime integrated financial experience. And um, just you approach things differently. Exactly. Yeah, look at that Dow speaking, even though uh, it's not really that meaningful, everybody focuses on it, probably because Dow Jones owns it, right? <laughs> but it's 38,000. It should be 92,000. Uh, it's really uh, shocking to me. Even last year, David, the S&P returned. If you looked at the Dow Jones, or excuse me, the S&P on day one and at the end of the year on the price only, it's 24% return. But we had a 26% return because of that 2%. I, I was speaking to one journalist. He says, I don't even use those anymore. I just use the ETF, that some oh. ETF that tracks yeah. you know, the S&P. And uh, he, he works for MarketWatch. I says, why don't you talk to the people and see if you can get them to change it because it should be. One thing that occurred to me is, you know, it's it's changing, you know, by the second on TV. Maybe if they were including dividends, they would have problems getting that. Oh, no, it's probably it's and who cares about the day-to-day -day numbers anyway? I mean, yes. you know, uh, here again, that's just the noise. You know? Yeah. Speaking so. of some more noise, I hear there's some Bitcoin ETFs and did I hear you were coming out with an ETF uh, based on Bitcoin? Uh, you, you heard wrong. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm old. Call me old fashioned. I I like uh, assets that have a dividend or their interest uh, income. You know, uh, has some earnings, huh? And some earnings. I mean, yeah. let's talk about that because I always kind of also joke with my clients who want to buy Bitcoin. I said, "Can you get me the earnings report on the Bitcoin for the last quarter?" You know. What what what, okay. what were those earnings? And maybe you could talk about the present value of future earnings and the price. Look, uh, you know, blockchain technology is really important. It will have a lot of uses. Uh, yeah. Bitcoin, to me, reminds me so much of the 70s when you had these gold bucks. In right. the 70s, the price of gold shot off, shot up because of inflation and so forth. And um, um, you just, people that were in love with it, they were gold bugs. You could not give them an argument as to why uh, uh, that didn't make any sense. You know, uh, how much gold jewelry can you sell, right? I mean, it's, right. Uh, but uh, people did it. And I think when we started the firm 42 years ago, gold was around $800 an ounce. Now I think it's like 16 or 1700, you know, double right. over, uh, 
you know, the last 42 years, our microcap portfolio has gone up almost a uh, hundredfold <laughs> over that wow. time period. Uh, Crazy. So, uh, you know, that's, I'm, I'm willing to take a side bet 20 years. Let's make it 30 years from now. Because if I lose, I won't be around to pay it off. <laughs> yeah. But uh, happy to bet on on the S&P 500 versus Bitcoin. I'll take that bet any day of the week. The variability is about the same. And you get something that has a dividend. Right. Or, or at least earns earnings. It doesn't necessarily have to have a dividend. Because, right. you know, they can keep, right. those, they keep those dividends and then reinvest them in the company and, and make it grow. I mean, the, the irony of the dividend, I mean, this was Merton Miller also about the irrelevance dividend, of the yeah. dividend and stock selection anyway, right. because the value of the company declines by the amount of the dividend. Because I like to say because cash is the easiest thing to value in the company, <laughs> right? Yep. Yep. Uh, but be because of the noise of daily returns, I don't think a lot of people get to see that. Okay. I have one last topic that I'd like to discuss. And it's pretty important. I don't know if you saw the article. I think it was in the New York Times just recently where Elon Musk was uh, comparing concept of indexing proxy voting to ISIS because I think one of the proxy consulting firms is ISS or something. <laughs> and so I was immediately reminded of all the effort that Dimensional uh, takes in their analysis of their proxies. What do you call that? Your governance uh, committee, right. I guess. Yeah. And so could you just explain what you do in terms of this governance? And I don't know if you know much about BlackRock and Vanguard, State Street, what they do and how that might be uh, different. Well, I, I only know what I read in the press about what they do and Frequently, I know Larry Fink uh, posits some uh, personal opinion about uh, what companies should do or shouldn't do. Uh, right. We don't do any of that. What we were focused on is standing up for shareholder rights. Central to capitalism uh, and the success of it is shareholders monitoring management. Uh, and uh, now we don't get into their business plans, you know, so forth. But, no. you know, when... We do uh, stand up, we want to make sure we don't get diluted our interests. And there are any number of things. Funny enough, this is where Fama and French, from the very beginning, were very active in this because it, because of this role of monitoring. We've taken it, we take it very, very seriously. And we don't, we have clients, I mean, whatever issue is out there, we have clients on both sides, I mean. <laughs> You know, uh, yeah. so uh, in terms of tastes and preferences, we try to take those into account um, have, if they have a separate account. But um, uh, we're not, uh, we're, we're mainly focusing in our, are they doing things ethically and um, responsibly? And, um, if they are, we um, we vote for, we, we vote for them. It's, uh, it's when these, People start to go off the ranch a bit. Either they are too, they really don't have independent directors, or they, or they really uh, start buying uh, insurance policies from the son of the CEO and things right. like that. You know, those are things we look at. And anyway, it's we take so, it. So we think that's part of adding why we're not pat, really pat, we're not. We're active on the execution. We look at, right. That's just another example. Yeah, you've got a pretty a active committee. Um, I remember we we went we dove took a deep dive into some of your individual decisions uh, a while back and did a video on that. And I was impressed with what you're doing there. And uh, <clears throat> since Elon's right there in Austin with you, maybe you can catch him for lunch and explain. Oh yeah, right. Uh, the right way to do that. <laughs> Right. Send him a welcome basket. Hey, I noticed. I, listen, I I didn't say anything about your philanthropy, but uh, you have been so generous and and I see so active in many universities. Of course, the business school is named after you at the University of Chicago. But but also, I see now you're getting involved at the University of Texas, 
Austin and I see the giant Magellan telescope oh, right. is one of your latest donations. Can you just spend, just give me a few minutes on that? Because I know Mac had that huge telescope. Was this Mac's yeah. idea? Was this Mac's <laughs> idea? <laughs> no, 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 yeah, no. It, um, I, I won't get into the science too much, but it just, if you look at the numbers, you know, uh, what they're trying to do is figure out, can they get a little glimpse of, of uh, a piece of light that was five, that was emitted five billion years ago. I mean, you can't get, you can't do that with a pair of binoculars. And right. it's kind of like this giant Magellan telescope, about ten times the size of the biggest current uh, telescope. Um, wow! It's um, and it's a two billion dollar project. Uh, okay. And it's a consortium by universities and government agencies and have raised it. And um, I came in through the University of Texas participation. So it's right. all just giving back. I, I think most people, when they get to be my age, I'm now 77. Um, yeah. You know, let's try to, let's look at those like things, you, yeah. you know, and this kind of scientific inquiry is the kind of thing that appeals to me. And right. they're doing a great job and they've earned it. That's, that's awesome. That's how I approached the business school with my huge gift. Yes. They earned it. They had all these yeah, people talking about joined early on. They're taught at the University of Chicago. I mean, I, I don't know if we would have gotten the business off the ground without their help. So well, that's clear. That's clear in the film. Yeah. And I think yeah. your gift was originally valued at three hundred million, but you gave stock. Uh, do you have any update on the value of that gift given the stock? <laughs> I think they've gotten so thus far the dividends. They've gotten something like five or six hundred million dollars so far. So that's that's incredible. It's, it's to, that's fine. Yeah. You know? And of course, then you have Kansas and, uh, you know, because you grew up in Kansas and were yeah. a shoe salesman in those early days. But I see you you donated to the football stadium there. And of course, you bought the rules of basketball. How How is that uh, little room? Uh, didn't they build a little room to put the rules in? Yeah, so a little extension on the field house. Yeah, it's just, it is now... The field house is now the most visited building in the state of Kansas. Somebody told me. I don't know if it's true or not, but it's one of the most visited. Anyway, that's so cool. No, it's transformed the football stadium, the basketball stadium, the additions. Uh, have really transformed that part of Kansas. That's that's the benefit of philanthropy when you can see a, an immediate impact. You know, it's uh, makes you feel good. Well, Don't David, your, it's really well, been. I've, I've really enjoyed this, Mark. Thank you so well, much for inviting me. Uh, it was uh, my pleasure, and it's been uh, just an incredible experience working with you and your team over there over all these years. Just as a reminder, we select dimensional completely independent. They don't pay us anything. Uh, you do give me interviews once in a while, which is good, but uh, I hope uh, our listeners realize that we're focused on all this education. And, we always uh, tell people, if you can find somebody to do a better job than us, you have to do, you have to use that. You, you do. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. All right, David, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, really appreciate your time today. Okay, have a great thank day. you. We'll talk to you later. All right. Bye-bye.